like climate change, obesity, inequality. Um, we have three roles. We do applied research with innovation partners, so lots of testing of ideas. We're also a venture builder, so we both build companies from scratch and invest in early stage companies. And we're a system shaper, trying to shape the policies and institutions relevant to those three missions. Um, in addition to, to that, we have the Behavioral Insights team as part of our family um, and, the, and Challenge Works. Um, that work on a broad range of areas right around the world, challenge works running prizes, Babel Insights team analogy. doing trials around the world. So that's a bit of a portrait of uh, Nesta. Um, one of the projects that we're working on at the moment is called UK 2040. And we're trying to think through what are the big challenges facing the country over the next 15 years? Where, can, where is there agreement, disagreement? What are the options we should be working up? And one of our reflections, I think, when you go through that process is that while many problems feel intractable and difficult, there are actually policy solutions. But what is difficult are the politics. And even the second and third best policy idea is difficult politics. And I think that's the context, in a way, for this conversation. Because if we are to try and meet the scale of the challenges facing the country with ambitious policies, we have to find ways of forging agreement on quite radical ideas, not lowest common denominator politics. And one of the ways in which politicians and governments have responded historically is to try and insulate policy and government from politics, create independent institutions, Bank of England, um, the Climate Change Committee, even the NHS was attempted, to, it was pushed into independence under David Cameron, short, rather short-lived. Um, so actually what we're talking today about is the opposite. Can we deepen democracy, deepen engagement, because that is a more stable, democratic way of doing things and is actually critical if we're going to make change happen without the blowback that comes from trying to insulate people from politics, which is frankly often a fool's errand. So we have a fantastic panel to um, discuss this really fascinating issue. We've got Nicholas Gruen, who is over here from Australia, who's the CEO of Lateral Economics and a visiting professor at King's College. Um, Nicholas has written on many, many issues, uh, including this particular one. We've got Martin Wolf, who needs no introduction, chief um, economics commentator at the FT. Um, and I think one chapter of his book is actually dedicated to this particular question that we're discussing today. And we have Claire Mellier, who's the co-founder of the Global Assembly for COP26, is an expert in participative processes um, and is knowledge and practice lead at the Ismay Foundation. So welcome to our panel. Um, this is an area of work that Nesta has quite a lot of history in. We've done a lot of work in. At the moment, our Center for Collective Intelligence Design, CCID, is doing quite a lot of work practically on the ground. Um, so do check them out as well, and we'll potentially bring in some of those ideas during the panel. The format for today is Nicholas is going to come up and do a, um, a talk for about 25 minutes. We'll hear a response from Claire and Martin, and then we'll have a panel and panel discussion and throw it open to both questions here and online, so do get your questions ready. So, over to you, Nicholas. Thank you. <laughs> Better not forget this, but just in case, I'll also not forget that. Okay, so I'm told that if I press this button, that happens, and it did, so that's encouraging. Um, that's what I'm going to talk to you about, uh, democracy, doing it for ourselves, and that is a quick outline that you, uh, of what I'm going to talk about that you won't have time to read, but it proves to you that I've got some system to all this. Um, now I want to talk to you, you may be familiar with this typology from Aristotle, uh, these three types of government. And I want to point out a, sing, a, a simple thing to you, which is that two of these systems have a government and the government. Uh, so, sorry, a, govern, a government and the governed. Uh, that's true of monarchy, it's true of aristocracy. And Aristotle had a beautiful description of what democracy was. It is everyone taking turns in being governed and in governing. And that means that if you asked Aristotle, 
about different institutions and you asked Aristotle what type of institution was, were elections, he would have said to you they were aristocratic institutions because they are designed to produce a government to govern the governed. And that's, that's a simple explanation for why the founding fathers in America chose elections over other mechanisms, which they were well aware of, because democracy was a dirty word at the time that they were thinking about designing the Constitution of America. And the thing that gives people a turn in governing or being governed is a democratic, lo a democratic lottery and it remains in our legal system and it is, and it is recognised uh, in Magna Carta and so on. Thomas Jefferson had a hope and the hope was, because he was anxious about democracy like all the others, and his hope was that elections would produce a natural aristocracy. How's that going then? Which brings me to the corruption of institutions. And in each of these cases of Aristotle's uh, institution and then a corrupt form of that institution, what has happened is that the office holder or holders have lost the thread of what their purpose is, which is to be the vehicle for their society's well-being and they've started to pervert that to, I think you know what, the, what, what they've perverted it to, their own well-being. And so that's a better picture of what we find, of the situation that we find ourselves in. And, you know, thanks to uh, Dali, uh, if I press this, I think it'll point, no? Um, anyway, um, the vine, if you like, is a delicate thing, and that's the opinion of the people, what the people want, and the spiky, nasty thing is a whole lot of other things like comms directors, people who, with a lot of money and power, and so on. And it's not that the people aren't involved in democracy, they are, but there's constant, uh, there's constant negotiation between those two things. And one of the great, uh, one of the great uh, things that gives people of power a lot, of, a lot more leeway than you might think in theory they had uh, was, is vox pop democracy, which is that we run our society on what people think right now. And this is what human beings look like uh, according to one artist um, a few tens of thousands of years ago and at this point uh, they, evolved the, they evolved a desire for food that was sweet, fatty and uh, salty. And that's where we are now. And things that were the stuff of life, the, the things that were good for us, when optimised to that degree, become poison. And that's what we've done with our politics. We've fast foodified it. Uh, now, people blame the internet for this, but let me show you something that happened before the internet arrived. This is the length of a soundbite, of a presidential soundbite on on American network news and we're starting with 1968 and we're going to 1988 before the before social media was even a glint in Mark Zuckerberg's eye and that is what has happened uh, the length of a soundbite has gone from 42 to nine seconds if you can't communicate something in nine seconds it doesn't get communicated uh, and that's if you're the president. Uh, we also have intensifying 
culture war. If you are out there prosecuting politics, you're not interested in debating the issues, you're trying to frame the issues, you're trying to set up rival camps, you're trying to get people to identify with this camp or that camp. And that's largely the story of Brexit. So this is the vote for and against, uh, uh, yes, for and against Brexit. And as you know, in the middle of 2016, the vote was 52 for and 48% against. And now it is about 60, 40. And still, for various reasons, we have this idea that we have, an, we have the will of the people that we are carrying out when it is no longer the will of the people. In fact, it is a long, long way from the will of the people. So that's the scenario that I want to address. And I wouldn't really be very interested in any of this if I didn't think that there were things that we can do that are simple and powerful to have a big impact on making this better. And uh, being an economist, of course, it's, uh, I like to talk about Mr. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes. And I want to use just a very simple um, expression from him. And he was writing about the Great Depression in 1930. And he used this expression, we have magneto trouble. And what he was saying was that if we take this problem to be a, a cosmic morality play, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. But if we take it, if we ask ourselves carefully, calmly, what mechanisms might we be able to adjust? How much can we, how much can we fix this? Uh, and he had an answer for that in economics, and many economists think that his answer was a very fertile one. And it was a simple one. That's important too. And so here's, uh, here's a way of thinking what I think is a very important part of the answer. And that is to say that virtually every democracy that you can think of is a three-legged stool. It contains elements of the three the, the three legs are three different democratic institutions. Uh, the middle leg there I've called direct democracy. In Athens, it was the assembly. In our system, it is simply voting. So we all get a say. Uh, then we need more than that. And so we have people who are represented. Let's see if that works. No, that just turns everything off. That's a bit of a pity. And if that, no, anyway, I can't point, that's all right. So, uh, and then we have two different ways to represent the people, because what we need is we need a small group of people who will make themselves knowledgeable enough to make decisions on our behalf, to make decisions for our benefit. And one way to do that is representation by election. And we've, and, and I've given you a little hint of all of the things that, that uh, deviate from the textbook, our imagining of what that might be like and what it actually turns out to be like because representation by election is mediated, uh, is mediated democracy. And I think that mechanism is an important mechanism uh, and if I didn't think that it wouldn't matter because who the hell am I? And then there's this other way to represent the people and we use it every day in courts. And that way to represent the people is to grab some people who we have reason to believe are, rep are similar to, representative of people, of, the, of ordinary people. And of course, as you know, we use that in uh, uh, legal juries. In Athens, they used that to run the whole city. They had a thing called the Council of 500, the Boule, and one-tenth of those 500 people at any one time were running the city, they were maintaining the monuments and the buildings and, and, and uh, all the other things that uh, had to go on as well as preparing the agenda for the assembly, the, the supreme decision-making body. Uh, and they used elections just for a few officers, uh, generals 
and also some financial officers. Now, let's go back to Brexit and let's see what a citizen jury thinks. In 2017, there was a citizen jury in this city funded by four universities. And they, so this is a year after the, the, uh, the plebiscite. And they said to the press that they weren't trying to relitigate Brexit. Remember how terrified people were of that. They were looking at what sort of Brexit people wanted. But in fact, if you dug into the data, there was an entry question and an exit question about what you think about Brexit. And if you asked yourself that question, you found that over the four days of deliberation, nobody who voted leave, sorry, nobody who voted remain changed their vote, and seven or eight people who voted leave changed their preference. And so the citizen jury produced pretty much exactly the state of opinion that exists today with the experience that we've had so far. Here's one other example, and I mention it to you because I want you to think about the theatre of this. So if you're voting, and let's say you're voting on the environment, you're constantly being campaigned to, people are, you, there are a bunch of people who you don't like, who are on the telly all the time telling you a whole pack of lies or whatever you think they are, and then there's your side, and maybe you think they're all right, or maybe you think they're a bunch of mugs as well. And in a situation like that, you go to the voting booth and you're pretty determined not to be the mug. You're pretty determined not to be taken for granted. Compare that with being in a room of people who exemplify the situation that you're in, which is that you should be thinking about your own interests and you should be thinking about that in the context of all of our interests because that's what most other people there will be trying to do. And in that context, uh, in a citizen jury in Texas, which you may be intrigued to know was commissioned by Governor George W. Bush in 1999, I think, uh, the, the, going into the uh, citizen jury, people were asked, would you pay a little bit more, and it was a very small amount more, for renewable energy as opposed, uh, for renewable energy rather than fossil fuel uh, produced energy. And 54% of people going in said they would. And coming out, 82% of people said they would. So that's the difference of, a, of this different way to frame decisions, to frame political decisions in people's minds. Now, the problem for me is that the citizen juries have been improving, in, uh, have been becoming more popular. Lots of people think these are good things. But I think we're only really at the end of the beginning because almost all citizen juries have been one-off, temporary, subject-specific, and they, and they advise the real lawmakers, which of course um, which of course rehearses their inferiority, rehearses the fact that the real lawmakers, they're the ones who make the decisions. And again, a great de a lot of citizen juries are run at the, uh, because governments have set them up, because governments have got into a problem and they think this might be a way out. I'm not really against any of that, that's great. Uh, but I think if we're going to try and make this uh, this approach more, if, we try, if we're trying to make the next step, you can be here for decades going to governments and saying, what about this, what about that? I have some experience of people who have spent a lot of time doing that and it's uh, quite frustrating. So I want to suggest something and as I've suggested this, it's occurred to me that it's actually quite a new and powerful thing. I want to be an activist. I want some activism around this. So there's some activists. There's another activist. There are some activists. And if I ask myself, what are they doing? They're not going somewhere and asking for permission. 
They're not trying to please. They're not placing themselves in a position of supplicants, uh, though they will perhaps do that in other contexts. What they are doing is they are asserting an alternative legitimacy. And that's what I want to do with citizen juries. But there's a big difference because these people are partisan. These people are represent a particular group of people who believe they are hardly done by. And certainly the ones I've shown you, I'm good with that claim. There are some others I'm less good with. But what I'm talking about is something, it, it has occurred to me, is a different kind of activism. It's a non-partisan activism. It's an activism of the centre and it's an activism not for a particular sub-community but for the system, for the health of our democracy. So the goal is, to, as the 18th and 19th century negotiated by cameralism, two different chambers. Initially, the lower chamber represented the people, aka the House of Commons. The upper house represented property. Uh, I won't go into why that wasn't really the case until 1920, but you, you get the picture. Uh, that was true in the United States as well. It was true in my country, Australia. Upper houses, typically, you couldn't vote for an upper house without a fair bit of property uh, and so on. Uh, and so each is a check and a balance on the other. Uh, we need a people's branch, a branch chosen by sampling to represent a check on elected representatives. So what could be the means of doing this rather than going to the government and asking? Uh, well. What I, would, what I would be doing, what I am trying to do, is to privately fund a standing citizen assembly. Uh, well, I want to commence with philanthropy, and that doesn't mean we can't take small donations. Just mention that in case you're interested. Um, uh, but if we can get this done from philanthropic money, I think when people see this, and I've got a lot of evidence for this, when people see this, they'll come up with their £100 a year and say, I'm in, I want to fund this thing. And the idea would be, say over five years, you phase out philanthropic funding, you get crowdfunding, but all the time you are campaigning for government, governments to fund this, uh, uh, so to fund it with ongoing funding and also a constitutional role for this body. Again, remember we live in an open society. Some people might disagree with that, but there's an assertion for you. And this chamber, if it has a lot of legitimacy, can challenge the rest of the system if it wants to. And the challenge I would like to suggest that it uh, issue the rest of the system is to say, if it disagrees with a vote of the house, of the lower house or the upper house, it petitions that House to hold the vote again by secret ballot. And if it could do that, we would have avoided the hard Brexit that has done so much damage to Britain. We would have avoided the abolition of carbon pricing in Australia in 2013. And we would have, uh, yes, we would have impeached Donald Trump who six Republicans in the Senate voted to impeach Donald Trump the second time round. We didn't need that many more to get a two-thirds majority in a secret ballot. I will assert to you would have done it. So that's the power that it can claim for itself, whether the houses will cooperate or not. Well, I'm not all that optimistic, but then we campaign and we try and get that written into, uh, into the, the laws of the land. So that's the basic idea. Uh, a standing chamber, it models the way people solve problems because that's what happens in citizen assemblies and juries as opposed to creating them, which is largely what has become what people do when they're elected because to be elected and stay elected, you create a problem and you, you're the solution to that problem. Um, it illustrates deviations between the opinion of the people and their considered opinion. Uh, there's no other, there's no institution that's doing that. Uh, surveys don't, uh, surveys, opinion polls don't do it. Uh, and they challenge elected 
representatives to do likewise, to represent the considered opinion of the people and they seek secret ballots where they disagree. There's another role that such bodies can have and, if, and, and here's the thing that's happening in democracy at the moment, which is that basic democratic norms are not being upheld by the system. Perhaps one of the most dramatic things to illustrate that is the way in which the United States Supreme Court has become politicised, even though the Founding Fathers built a mechanism in to try to stop that happening, and that's confirmation hearings. But of course, the confirmation hearings have become massively politicised. Well, it turns out that the people themselves will defend basic democratic norms, but they won't do it if you ask them to vote at the same time as voting for a leader or voting for what they think different parties will do to their electricity prices. That, that, that doesn't turn up high in the, on the dial. But if you put people together in a group and you say, should we gerrymander this state? As you probably know now, it wasn't always the case, but now Republicans have far, gained far more from deliberate gerrymandering in numerous American states than Democrats. 92% of Democrat voters are against gerrymandering. Guess how many, guess what the proportion of Republican voters, these are the ones who vote, for, many of whom vote for Donald Trump. Guess what proportion of Republican voters think gerrymandering is a good idea, 80, uh, is a bad idea, excuse me, 88%. And therefore, a, a citizens will defend basic democratic norms far more than politicians in the right structures, such as the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, which has a role in the Michigan Constitution to redistrict, to draw electoral boundaries, and has cleaned up uh, gerrymandering in, a, in the short time that it's been around. Uh, so how do we embed a people's branch? You see, what I've done is I've talked about the, the idea is this body would be uh, renewed with new people sampled from the community on a rolling basis. So it, it's, uh, so there are two problems. One is existing institutions have built, uh, like the House of Commons and the House of Lords, have built their sense of themselves, their procedures and so on through various crises for centuries. Uh, and there is a continuity of leadership there. Uh, so what I suggest is that um, uh, that, that the uh, citizen, with, with citizen assemblies being new and continually re renewed, I would propose a council of elders from the alumni that is produced by each cohort, and I would try to select the best dozen of each cadre and they would become an, a, a council of advisors. They would have no, uh, and this is illustrative, there are different ways of cutting this, but th they would have no further power. I will, uh, and so I'll tell you a little, as, so this is a way of squaring the circle between, the, this is a way of trying to get to Jefferson's dream where we are actually promoting the best people. And let me tell you of something that really excited me when I heard about the Adelaide, citizen, uh, the Adelaide citizen jury on nuclear waste. There were 340 people in that citizen jury and they needed to choose spokespeople to speak to the Premier. And there they are, the spokespeople and the Premier, uh, Jay Wetherill, is on the left there. Uh, and they didn't want to hold an election. So what they did was they uh, randomly selected a group of people, about 10 people, on the last day of the citizen jury, and they said, please join us uh, in a, a room for two hours. The first hour will be spent identifying the criteria according to which we want spokespeople, and the second hour identifying who we've met in the citizen jury who best meet those criteria. And then they went and asked people if they'd be happy to be spokespeople, and, the, and, and those who agreed were spokespeople. A nice little cherry on the cake, this was extremely popular, it was extremely successful. A nice bit of cherry on the cake for me is that the group of spokespeople was gender balanced, but gender balance was not one of the criteria. 
In other words, they were ideally gender balanced, not artificially gender balanced. Um, that to me, I, I wrote an article, I, I was blown away by that. I thought that's a very exciting mechanism and I wrote an article about it and the, the people who improvised this method were a little mystified that I'd got so excited. Um, sometime later, I discovered that this is how Venice governed itself for 500 years. You will have heard of coups and uh, blood feuds up and down the Italian peninsula, breaking, you know, causing mayhem in most of the cities of the Italian Renaissance and, and medieval period. Venice had no, coup, no successful coups, uh, was a stable government for 500 years, for 290, from, two, from 1297 to 1797 when Napoleon turned up and said, called drinks. Um, and the way they did this was, so think of Venice as a little bit like Athens. Athens had about 20% of the population had a vote and they were radically equal. This was about 3,000 nobles who, had, uh, who were the sovereign body governing Venice. And what they did was they would randomly select people from that council. They would lock them up, think of the papal conclave. They're not allowed out until we get 15 new senators two new councillors for the doge and a financial controller. Uh, they are given a secret ballot, so if people want to campaign or threaten or bribe them, you just walk out of the conclave and say, yep, yep, did your bidding, and you can't tell whether they did or not. Uh, a really, really interesting mechanism which solves Jefferson's problem of trying to get, of trying to identify merit without flicking the switch towards Machiavellianism, narcissism, and whatever else the third triad is. I'm sure someone can tell me. Uh, I wanna, con I'll, I'll conclude with uh, what Joan Robinson, uh, you know, I'm an economist and I've quoted uh, Maynard Keynes. This is the second, this is the second edition of her Economics of Imperfect Competition, published the first way back in 1933. This was the second edition, 1969. And she said that, um, that the, the, book, the book had become canonical and yet it frustrated her because she said all the good things, all, all the things that she, that she didn't care about, which were all those graphs, all those things that she thought were a bit of a fudge, they went into the canon. But what she was really concerned about was this, which is that consumer, as she wrote, consumer sovereignty can never be established as long as the initiative lies with the producer. For the great run of consumer goods, the buyer is necessarily, necessarily an amateur while the seller is a professional. Now she's just talking about consumer goods, but think about all the other parts of our economy and then think about our political system and that is the problem writ large. And this is something of a solution. It's not a solution because we create a new institution which is part of the system, it is because we take, we sample from the community, we give people the time, we give them the uh, capacity to start knowing enough to take turns in governing and being governed. Um, I said that was the last thing, I'll make it the last thing, I might come back to that and, I, and if somebody does want to ask me why uh, if somebody does want to ask me why Susan Boyle is on this presentation, we'll just have to handle it in questions. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Nicholas. Um, Claire, do you want to respond first? Okay. <laughs> Great uh, challenge. Thank you. Um, so. I suspect where I'm coming from is that we're hearing you talk in a way about the need for change. And it's coming from you, and it's coming from movements and activists, and it's coming, uh, but it's coming actually from the, the lay citizens and the general public, and that's backed up by evidence, and there's pure research that shows that people want radical uh, system change, radical political system change. So it's not just us. Um, probably the 
usual suspects in, interested in politics that are asking for change. And it's not just the social movement. So I want to start from that, acknowledging that there's actually a, a demand for radical change right now. Um, and it's not just the theory and, and theoretical um, um, thoughts. It, it's actually happening. You know, citizens' assemblies and the, the deliberative processes. So you're using the term juries, but actually there's a, a, a wide range of methods which at the, at the heart of these processes, it's about not just about sortition and selection of um, people uh, at random, but it's also deliberation. These are the, the key components in citizens' assemblies, sortition and, and deliberation. So that's, um, that's really, it's happening, and we are seeing, you know, the OECD, I call as, you know, coined this, the, the deliberative wave, and we think actually there's a lot more that the OECD is acknowledging. Um, in the UK, for instance, the, during the Brown, Brown governments, there was, a, you know, more than 200 processes happening, deliberative processes. They might have not been called citizens' jury, but actually there was, there was a lot more happening. Um, and my, my organization, uh, ISWI, as um, we've been supporting um, uh, processes in Armenia, for instance, which I think speaks to your point about doing democracies, democracy ourselves. Um, there's, there's been an assumption for, I would say, um, the past you know, 10, 20 years that to have legitimacy, these processes need a mandate from power holders. And if you get a mandate, you will get, you know, a, a process will be designed that will lead to change. What we're noticing, uh, and I've been involved in more than 20 assemblies in the last few years, is that actually that's a bit simplistic and naive to assume that mandate and a good process lead to change. Politics is messy. And we've seen that with the French Convention Citoyenne, for instance, where there was a commitment from, the, from President Macron to not filter what was coming out of the assembly that would be uh, either translated into a referendum, regulation, or legislation. By the end of it, we know, and that's the thorns on your, <laughs> on your picture, we know how politics works. It's, it's messy. They are vested interests. And we need to acknowledge that, I suppose, when we're talking about uh, deliberative democracy, it's not just uh, good enough to do a process <laughs> that is robust, you actually need to think about how change happens. Where are these recommendations landing? And they land in a system that is not suited for actually radical change. So you need, to, when you think about the deliberative system, then you need to think about the different components in that system. And the Citizens' Assembly is a, a mechanism, but you need to think about what are, you know, narratives and culture. How does that shape what happens? Uh, um, what, what are, what's the role of the media? How is that going to influence what happens once you've got the recommendations? Where, why are the vested interests going, and at which point are they going to influence, you know, the, the process between the recommendation and the legislation? So, and this is what we tried to do in an article we wrote um, last month um, called um, Let's Get Real About Citizens' Assemblies. It's actually, let's, let's really talk about politics and how power works, so we need to become power literate. So just to, to um, you know, in a way, uh, support completely your argument that we need to do democracy ourselves, we need to reclaim it and not put all our hopes into existing power holders, hoping, you know, in a way that's quite disempowering to say, and I've seen that time and time again when I was facilitating these assemblies, people were really activated that sense of, you know, individual and collective agency being created. And then they're realizing actually the change that we really believe is needed is not happening. So it is actually the risk, and that's the biggest risk I'm, I'm seeing at the moment, is that what that wave is actually crushing <laughs> Um, and that it creates disempowerment and disillusionment because the change is not happening. Um, and um, so just to, to summarize, um, I think we need to see the seeds of the change 
and and for me this this idea of doing it ourselves is actually is really empowering um, but that that requires thinking really carefully about then how do you make the change happen so it's not just about creating the process and that's what's so interesting for instance with this project in armenia called the convention of the future armenian which is a highly uh, complex political context with war happening in azerbaijan with azerbaijan a genocide literally another one happening uh, on our you know uh, doorsteps and they have created a completely independent citizens convention which has its own affiliation network which will take some of the recommendations forward which includes you know people from civil society businesses so they're not putting their hopes into the existing power holders mm. so this is where i completely uh, relate to the arguments of let's reclaim you know our power let's do democracy ourselves but let's be really careful about um, uh, not just putting all our hopes into a methodology, which mm. could become methodolatory. <laughs> uh, let's think about system change and how we're going to change that system collectively. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and finally, Martin, if you want to come up and, and give your response. So how many minutes do I have? Five? Got, yeah, great. OK. Um, Hmm. There's so many fascinating ideas here. Um, I'm sort of, I decided I'd sort of decide what to say when I heard what people said. Uh, the, um, so I'm a complete non-expert on the assemblies uh, and how they work. So my knowledge as such as it is doesn't overlap with Claire in anything, I think. And, the, and I got to this in a rather strange way. And basically, my starting point is because I got to it via Nicholas, that everything he says must be true and right. But what I will do, I think, is um, discuss um, three things, which is why I became interested in this. Um, the... Uh, this relates to the sort of what I think is the core problem in politics. And the third is what will be involved, and this is just a reaction to what Claire is saying, in sort of manage, in bringing about an insurrection, which is I think what you're talking about. Um, and uh, which is in other words, how do you actually make it politically effective? which is, I think, a pretty big question. Mm. Um, so why did I get to this? So I um, started writing in 2016 a book called, which is published last this year in February, called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. And basically, it came out of my view, which is not something I would have thought 10 years earlier, or um, certainly not 20 years earlier, that our political and economic system in as operating isn't working very well and i'm putting this quite gently and to me it seems clear that some form of capitalism is going to survive but i'm not at all clear that any sort of democracy is going to survive um and that's not something i'd expected and it was triggered by the obvious disaster Brexit would be not just economically, that's not important, but politically. Mm. It's created a form, it has reinforced a form of politics which cannot possibly deal with any of our problems. And I don't think anybody who's looked at the last seven years can really disagree with that. Mm. And of course, in America, they're about to elect a fascist. It's as simple as that. And it's a very open question, in my view, not very open whether America, America, even its current form of democracy, will survive. So this is a major crisis of our system. And the core, of, there are many core ways, of, but maybe one of the good way of thinking about it, a good way of thinking about it, is gets to Nicholas's point, which could be put in the same way that democracy, this is in my book, but not put it this way, democracy as we know it, representative democracy, emerged within 
a constitutional order and out of a constitutional order that itself was highly non-democratic, exactly. to put it so mildly. All monarchies, all and monarchies. what made it more or less peaceful in a country like Britain, that I won't go into the whole history of all this, which I spent a lot of time on, is precisely that. And that's where we get to Claire's question, because one very crude way of putting it is that at each stage in the process, vested interest, of which the most important were the landed aristocracy and then what uh, Marx would call the capitalists, recognized that giving the vote to a lot more people was better than having a civil war. And there were successive stages in this. Um, and we ended up with universal suffrage democracy. And the point was not to change too much. And it didn't change too much, except within the system, of course, it developed a new form, not a new form, an evolved form of the political process itself, which Nicholas has talked about, which is the corruption, the complete corruption of debate. I think we can describe that. This is very, so that's how we got sort of where we are. And in the process of making those adjustments, 40, 50 years ago, we designed a system to cope with this new arrangement, which very broadly could be defined as welfare capitalism, and that's broken down. In essence, is the argument of the book, very, very crudely. <coughs> so what do you do now? Well, one approach, which is I talked to at length, is try and reform politics, reform the economy in such a way through the political process that it works better for everybody. The other way to think about it is you need to reform politics. You probably need to reform both, and they have to come together. Um, and it's in that context that I came to Nicholas's idea and had only two or three pages, actually, on why citizens' assemblies and particularly creating a separate house of parliament selected by, ver by lot might be a really interesting idea and might do some useful things to remedy the problems we have. And Nicholas discussed a lot of that, and I don't have much uh, to add. The, uh, so that's why I got to it and what I think are quite nice ideas to start with. But the big point Claire raised is how do you make this or anything like it happen? Which is, of course, also the good, the big good critique of my own book. If I wrote a critique of my own book, it would basically say, well, how is any of this going to happen? And the answer is what Claire is suggesting in a very nice and genteel way is a revolution. <laughs> and and uh, because it's trying to undo the 200 years or so, give or take, of evolution of what was an aristocratic and monarchical system into a quasi-democratic system and say, we took the wrong course, we should have been Athenians. I won't go into all the problems with the Athenian system. That's another point altogether. I spent a lot of time as a classicist. But the, the point is, we have to be quite clear about this, and this is my really last point. If you want to do this, you have to recognize you're trying to overturn the logical, ba the, the, the logical basis, I think, of our political system, which is, as he said, an elective aristocracy. And, the, and the, um, to do that, you have to persuade the people at large that they are being fooled big time, very big time. And you're going to have to do that against every interest, uh, including all the media, such as the Financial Times. Um, so maybe what we should focus on, if we want something that big, is how you make revolutions happen. <laughs> right. I didn't expect you to end there, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't say um, I wanted to make this revolution. <laughs> no, right, I right. said, if you wanted this to happen, my ameliorationism, let's get an agreement that we can build on the assemblies that Nicholas thought. Make, them into an in make one into an institution. Mm -hmm. Make it legitimate to such a degree that people have to give it part, which to some extent happened with the House of Commons in exactly. a, over 100 years. Exactly. Uh, and sort of 
incremental, incremental stuff. But that change will probably be a, a century or so. Okay, let's, um, let's pick up on that, actually, because I want to ask, perhaps start with Claire or Nicholas. If you, if you take Ireland, which I think you mentioned, or Belgium, or Armenia, um, how did they get there? And um, what are we learning from those sorts of processes? I can start with France, mm -hmm. which I'm yep. quite <laughs> close to. Um, what was interesting with the French Climate Citizens Assembly, which had uh, more than 90% awareness in the French public um, by the end of the Climate Assembly, is that it started uh, with the Gilets Jaunes, and the social movement, the Gilets Jaunes, came together with deliberative democracy experts, activists, and they created this group, Les Gilets Citoyens, which then went to Macron and negotiated to hold a citizens' assembly. The momentum came from the social movement in France, and that led to a process that was really interesting and changed the narrative around what's possible with deliberative democracy. Um, and then it fitted within the existing power structure, and that, went, that was commissioned by Macron. What's interesting for me with the Armenian process, or what we've done with the Global Assembly, is we claim the space, what Gaventa calls a claim space, rather than a closed or invited space. So most of these citizens' assembly, when they're commissioned by power holders, are invited spaces. The power holders determines the, the framing, the agenda, the, the, you know, what, how much budget is going to go into it. I think what's interesting is to look at these claimed spaces and how they have legitimacy within themselves. It doesn't have, the legitimacy doesn't have to come from the power holders. If they are done well and they're transparent, and that's where the governance of these processes is absolutely critical, and we haven't really talked about it, but I think the governance of assemblies is where, for me, where the nuts and bolts and need to be really uh, open and transparent. Okay. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> one of the interesting things about Belgium, and just to explain to people who don't know, the German-speaking part of Belgium it's only 70,000 odd citizens, um, has a standing citizen council. And it's pretty much, I think, best practice. I think it's a perfect inst instrument. Uh, it has no formal power, but it is funded. 50 people sit for a year, and they have the power to commission additional citizen assemblies of a bunch of new people chosen at random, or, and, and they will write the terms of reference. And just before COVID, they initiated a process in which people were looking at the conditions in nursing homes rather presciently. Uh, they then moved, uh, and one of the interesting things is that a lot of the things that, a lot of the work that this body does doesn't, isn't very newsworthy because our politics uh, in the paper is only newsworthy politics. Uh, a quick factoid for you, a, uh, a, a small party in Austria that believes in sortition did a survey of Austrian citizens before the last election and asked them what they thought was the most important issue for parliamentarians to focus on in their next term. And the answer was education and the election was about immigration because you can't, it's not news. Uh, education doesn't get on the nightly news. We don't have fights about it. We don't have demonstrations about it, uh, and so on. The other interesting thing about um, East Belgium is that East Belgium, like so many European uh, policies, is run by proportional representation. And there are six parties, and all six voted for this thing. And in my discussions with Belgian people, they're a little bit mystified because I'm, and, and they realise that, uh, that, that this is a very different problem that I'm trying to solve, which is that I'm trying to solve a problem, I'm trying to build a, a branch of government that can start to pacify, <laughs> civilise, discipline this crazy freak show that we've got in our politics. Uh, so um, 
uh, all parties are not going to suddenly vote for a citizen assembly in Britain or Australia or the United States. So it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a different problem. I'll also just make a quick comment about Ireland, which is that Ireland is a sort of pin-up boy for this, and I think it's extremely successful. They've done about six or seven of these. Governments there understand that they can be useful to them, and so lots of, and so I would say that government, that 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 government in Ireland is right up the at the edge of what I call the end of the beginning, which is that they have not yet got an established constitutional position for citizen assemblies. But uh, Irish people like citizen assemblies, and I think that's a very valuable thing. And I just spent earlier this afternoon talking to somebody in. Uh, in government in in uh, the UK about the prospect, I, I said to, I said to this person, the most successful government in Australia, both in terms of policy and in terms of politics, was Bob Hawke, and Bob Hawke styled himself not as a political hero but as a steward of a process. That process in Australia was an accord between employers, employees, uh, farmers, the bureaucracy and big business, basically, and, and small business. And what that meant was that there were large social problems solved, and then they came to the and they came to the parliament, and if the, and of course, what's the role of the opposition? Basically, to make whatever trouble they can, and at which point one of the social partners would say to the, to the opposition, can you shut up? We've done a lot of work on this. This is going to be good for us. It's going to be good for everyone because we had to negotiate it through. I'm not suggesting you replicate that, but something like citizen assemblies can enable a politician, a senior politician, to present themselves to the nation as a steward rather than as the latest political hero, which will be a big hero for a while and eventually disappear, okay. torn down by the tabloids. Martin, you want to come come in? I just want to also ask you on this. Can you see a version where it is actually uh, an assembly that's um, invited by a political by by power holder as opposed to a bottom up revolution? Yeah, I was. I've been thinking about that. Um, actually, related to the discussion we just had. What are the circumstances in which politicians might be interested? in institutional <coughs> arrangements of this kind or anything that constrains their discretion in some way. And my sense of this within sort of broadly speaking functioning states, we can let's not get into the difficulty of deciding what they are, they exist, they operate and all the rest of it, mm. is, uh, and I can think of a few examples, when a potato gets so hot that they really, really don't want to handle it. Mm. My understanding, and I stress my non-expertise, is one of the reasons the Irish, for example, went in to do this on abortion, is that it was a nightmare issue. Um, so deeply divisive, um, so poisonous to politics, that it seemed very desirable to find a mechanism which look plausible and decent and reasonable for people to reach a consensus which didn't involve them having to make a decision which would end up a wildly outraging some very significant part of the population that, that, uh, that was sort of deeply invested in it. Um, and there are a few issues like that. Um, um, Nicholas mentioned Brexit. Well, that had obviously many of those characteristics. I could imagine that if Cameron had thought about it, I imagine is I would stress imagine that if he realised the mess he was going to get himself into, he might have said to, to George Osborne, you know, isn't there some way that we can depoliticise this ghastly thing that is tearing our party to pieces and will end up destroying it as a functioning government party, which it has, and, uh, and isn't this a possible way of doing it? The, the idea, I'm sure, never crossed their mind. But in other words, the, the supremely hot potato might be one reason that politicians are genuinely interested. Um, 
The other possibility, and this is more a question for Claire, and this is, gets more into the revolution stage. Now, I obviously have no expertise on what's been going on in Armenia, <coughs> except that pretty obviously the country is in simply staggering crisis as a place. And if you're in, in overwhelming crisis or the regime is beginning to break down in one way or another, then um, revolutionary things happen mostly very, very terrible revolutionary mm. things. Mm. But there are situations in which the break functioning order is so great that finding some way to work together becomes important. It is conceivable to me, therefore, or conceivable, I stress conceivable, that politicians in the US would start saying, if we continue down this where we're going, we're going to end up in a civil war. And that's really not a place that we want to get to. Is there any mechanism we can think of to resolve outside this war we're having uh, the, the really bitter contentious issues that divide us? Um, and again, that might be a situation in which politicians will agree this is the sort of thing we, 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 we could consider as an alternative. So they, those are a couple of imagined paths which might lead some political forces say actually we need the help of this uh -huh. because the politics we're now in is absolutely nightmarish. There's an assumption there though isn't there that the the process will come up with the right answer and that when people deliberate they suddenly become rather progressive and sensible. Um, uh, and sensible, I'm I don't yeah, equate don't sensible have... and progressive, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm much more reactionary than that. Good. Well, um, but, but you, you take my point. But there is an assumption that this is a, a way of, when people really weigh out the issues, actually they come up with a, a better judgment than when they haven't deliberated. But if you take, um, and I think there's lots of good examples of that being the case. Yeah. Um, I've been involved in, in one or two things on the energy side where we uh, got people to participate in a... Uh, a 2050 net zero plan and, and, and actually people come up with very, very sensible ideas, almost identical to the economist cost optimizing models that we put through in the energy department. If you it's talk very easy to get people to agree on what needs to be done in 2050. It, yeah. it is, but even, 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 even in the nearer term questions. But if you, took, that, if, 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 you, if, you, if you took questions that are very difficult, like the death penalty or immigration right now, um, would you take the risk of um, putting this through uh, a citizens' assembly, um, or, or would you be fearful of the potential um, consequences of doing that? I, 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 I would be a little fearful, but uh, my view on Brexit, for instance, was that Brexit was a mad thing to do but that if the British people really wanted to do it and understood what they were doing, I would be in awe. I would think good on you. You're going to take a 4% lower income. We don't live by bread alone. And this is what you want to do. Um, so, there's all, and, and so there's almost no... Uh, it's true that if, if one saw citizen juries swing towards retributive ideas and I think there are for instance um, there are some precedents of juries in the south simply not convicting white murderers of black people so I wouldn't be that that, that I would take to be a problem <laughs> um, but 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 generally all the evidence I've seen is that the considered opinion of the people is very sane and it's better than the opinion of the people. And if it, if, if it differed from me, except on a few incredibly visceral points, I'd go with their considered judgment, not mine. That's, I believe that, it, that that's, that's, those are my values, if you like. Claire, on, on sort of issues where particularly the public are really much more to the right of, say, the political elite, would you? So uh, I was in Copenhagen at the Deliberative Democracy Conference recently, and we had a session on are some topics too hot to tackle? And um, there were very different views within the Deliberative Democracy ex experts, and some were saying, actually, we can't go on, on these very polarized topics. And I, um, and I, I don't think personally that a topic is too hot to handle. I think um, it's about 
the expectation, so a lot of deliberative democracy experts ex uh, put into these processes the expectation of consensus. I don't think that's what they are about. I think it's much more about actually surfacing the, the deep fears and hopes and governing sentiments and not expecting that we're all going to come to an agreement. But actually, it's realizing that we, we can live together and agree to disagree in a way that is respectful. And so it's quite a profound difference. And there's someone uh, called uh, Shimri who is... Uh, um, uh, an activist from Israel who has been, you know, um, uh, basically pri imprisoned um, because he was he was supporting, you know, peace the peace process in Israel, and he's, he believes that a citizens assembly process on on, you know, uh, what's happening in Israel at the moment could really be be done. So I think I wouldn't, I mean, I'm not the one who needs to answer that. I don't, I don't know. But I would talk to people who actually have thought about this. And, and Professor Nicole Curato, for instance, has written this book called um, Democracy in Times of Crisis. And she really understands what's possible in really deeply polarized states in, in the Philippines, for instance. So I think it's, it's, um, it's possible. We just need to be brave. Okay, um, over to Martin, and then we'll go to the floor um, for questions. I haven't thought about this deeply, but I have thought quite a bit about what democracy means. And, uh, and it doesn't mean unbridled majoritarianism. I mean, here I'm with Jefferson, if I may say so. And it's a constrained system. And the most important constraints, and we, can, we don't have the time to discuss how, where they would come and how, are obviously individual rights. So uh, I wouldn't pr support any democratic process, including this one, which allow people, for example, to decide by majority vote that a large proportion of the population should be killed. OK? That's a constraint, right? You're not allowed to do that. I thought uh, you were reactionary, reactionary Martin. <laughs> I'm completely rational. <laughs> Individuals are ultimately, majority, democracy is only important because individuals are important. That's the core value. Human beings are important because as individuals in making state decisions which have to be collective, we have to have a process that allows in the best possible way the aspirations, hopes, and ideas of everybody be involved. And that's, I think, what we're discussing. But if you accept that, this is my view, that the demand for democracy derives from the value of human beings per se, then there are things you can't, aren't allowed to do to individual human beings just because of a majority of people would like to do them to them. In other words, there have to be fundamental rights in a system. I'm not going to discuss how you get there, mm -hmm. but that's why every constitution has them. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the, the worst example of the Athenian democracy was in a debate of exactly this kind, which is the Sorry. fame, the Melian debate, oh, yes. as you know. Uh, now, admittedly, this was written out by Thucydides, one but the, the point is, to me, uh, all <laughs> democratic processes have to be constrained by fundamental human rights. Yeah. Now, how that fits into immigration is more difficult because the civic rights of non-citizens are an interesting question. But in the case of capital punishment, I'm pretty clear. OK. Thank you. Let's go to the floor. Um, let's take three questions in a row. Um, take the lady there, gentleman there, and the gentleman just behind, if that's OK. Could you bring the um, uh, microphone over and we'll, so everyone can hear online? So, Lady there. Can you just put your hand up? Sorry. Thanks very much. Um, my name's Sarah Lennon, and I'm organising with a group called Just Stop Oil. So I was really interested in um, Martin's point of, you know, that basically what we need is political insurrection, because I would agree with him. And I think we do need it to change politics, because our politic our process right now is failing us hugely. So currently, this September was 1.78 degrees above the pre-industrial average. And so, Martin, I don't even think capitalism is going to survive the, the way that we're going, never mind democracy. 
So, and also, we're on a trajectory where we are going to kill millions of people. That's what our democratic process is currently doing, if not billions of people. So I think my question is, I, I mean, I don't know if just the poor are going to uh, uh, achieve it. Possibly not, but those, you know, today there's an 18 year old who got sent to prison because, you know, they really believe that we need to change this political system that we have. So, what are you going to do to help achieve that, that change to take place? Because there already are people on the streets demanding and, and occupying that space, you know, saying something different has to happen. So, how do we use them? to make the the change in our political process happen okay can you just pass it to the gentleman there thank you thanks um james robertson from sortition foundation um you mentioned 2040 at the start our vision is that by 2040 um the powers and responsibilities that are currently held by the house of lords will be held by a house of citizens a permanent rolling citizens assembly um and we realize that's ambitious and that's why we've already started the campaign. Um, but we do think we have an opportunity. So on the question of how that has come up, um, as I'm sure people will be aware, Starmer has pledged to abolish the House of Lords, basically because everyone agrees it's pretty indefensible in a 21st century democracy. But it's done under the, he's, he's pledged to do that in order to restore trust in politics. Well, our polling shows that people are about four times more likely to trust ordinary people in a citizens' assembly than politicians to make a decision in their interests, right? So if it's trust in politics that you want, then a House of Citizens is the answer, not an elected second chamber. And then the other thing is, more people always say, well, that'll never happen, but then they've been debating, they've been trying to get an elected second chamber out of the Commons for the last 100 years, and it doesn't ever get very far. And so I wonder if there is a possibility that as, uh, Obviously, a House of Citizens wouldn't be elected, it would be selected, whether they would be seen as less of a threat. So I suppose my question is, what do you think of that idea? And, um, so the, and idea being, the idea being replace the House of Lords with... With the House of Citizens, basically. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Behind you. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Andreas Zachariah. I'm a systems architect. Uh, the seed I would like to plant in your mind is the cost of democracy could be just a pound. Uh, the question I'd like to ask is, no one's kind of mentioned money in politics. And the reason I say that is because money is power. And the political parties, e even in quite an informed audience here, I, I'd be surprised how many people realize that political parties, whether it's Conservative or Labour Party or the Lib Dems, they're really tiny. And I mean tiny by budget. Mm. And uh, if, if you look at the last 10 years, the major parties have a budget that's somewhere between 10 to 20 million a year it's largest in an election year none of these parties ever run uh, can balance the books they are not capable of running their own party like an efficient company like an or a business or an organization and then what happens is we have donations and those donations for the left come from unions but at least they represent Sorry, millions you got quite a question yeah the question is why are we talking about the influence of money in politics because politics shapes all the parties and there are 47 million registered voters in the uk and if we each paid one pound every year towards a pot we would have enough money to fund all the parties so they couldn't take any okay. donations all right thank you let's keep going with some more some points and questions let's keep them really short and then we can have let's let's have three or four more and then let's go to the panel for some final reflections if that's okay um let's go to this side of the room now um rory you've considered using this mechanism if you like for decisions to be taken in advance it occurs to me you could also have it as a check on, on and balance on decisions already made so there's a huge problem in politics of what is really reputational sunk cost so projects like high speed to continue long after the point of absurdity if you'd asked me, for example, to advise the Remain campaign, what I would have said is that there was a perfectly rational reason to vote Leave, which is you knew you'd never get a chance ever again to leave the European Union. Okay? The odds of being given that choice ever again in your lifetime were practically zero. You also knew that the political and governmental and economic class were slightly pervily obsessed with the European project to an extent which they would sign up to almost any future indignity. 
So if you'd asked me to advise that the Remain campaign, I would have said, look, if we remain in the European Union, we will have a citizens' assembly and permanent standing here. And if that reaches a point where 50% of the people or more want to leave, we will have a subsequent referendum. And then I think, I don't think many people wanted to leave in 2016. They wanted to leave for fear of what would happen in 2027. Because they'd been told it was an economic project, it turned into a political one. They had been misinformed. Now, if you did that with things like High Speed 2, large projects where you simply said, uh, we will do this thing, but at the point where it appears to be a failure, the Citizens' Assembly can override it and provides a low embarrassment way of stopping, that could also be useful. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Um, let's um, take one from the, f um, the online, um, and then let's take um, one at the back there. Yes, yeah, so I've got a question here from Martin online, and he said he very much likes the idea of kick-starting uh, citizens' assemblies with uh, philanthropy, and what kind of budget would be required to get kick-start this? Great, thank you. Um, I think the cloud hanging over this really fascinating conversation is urgency, because you know we're, we're talking about five years or 10 years time, and yet the progression towards potential fascism, as you've said, in America is on a much shorter timeline. And we've seen in the actions just in the last couple of weeks about the infringement of the independence of the police, you know, the same stirrings of that movement here. So I really want to pick up, I mean, it's, it's a sign of our times that the chief economic correspondent of the FT is the one calling for revolution. <laughs> um, I just want to follow up on your question. If we were going to have a revolution, can we dream all of that? Like, what does that look like? Can we do something before this pivotal election to try and make an impact and start, turn this ship around? Okay, and lady at the front. Hold on a second. The, hold on one second, just let me get the... Yep. the um... I just said, um, a question regarding public legitimacy, because I see that as the, as the core of everything. I mean, if we know the British people no longer see their system as legitimate, you know, will fall apart. How do we, if we think that democracy has to be depolarized uh, and get off the, 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 the parties fighting each other, which is how the system is set up, it means that we need more citizen engagement. How, so how do, how do we um, nurture that with the idea that individual rights come also with collective responsibility. And I, how, do we, how do we grow that in society? Because we have to stop, we have to stop expecting that some leader is gonna come and show us the way or give us all the answers. We have a collective responsibility to our co-citizens. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're gonna have to go now to the final round from the panel. Um, I'm gonna actually ask um, Martin to, to start off. There are a few questions there that you might wanna pick up. I think the question about um, checks and balances on decisions already made um, w w was interesting. Um, and also um, the, the, the question on um, you know, funding. Is this a big idea or a small idea? How, how expensive is this? OK, those, I think, are fairly straightforward. And I, but I want to raise, take up one. There are so many interesting questions, obviously, can't do. I think that's a very interesting idea. I haven't thought about it that way. Um, one of the ideas in my book, I probably stole it from Nicholas, I stole all the others, is that all referendums or proposals for referendums would go through the House of Citizens and that will be one of their permanent functions to depoliticize the, 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 the actual motion and they would have the right to initiate them. So that might be one way of getting it your, your uh, thing. My own suggestion, by the way, because I don't want to go to, for various reasons, is that there will be an additional House of Citizens. I would be open to discussion of replacing the House of Lords. I just think it will create more, um, more difficulties. And there are functions the House of Lords performs, which I don't know exactly how they would work in this system. I haven't thought about them enough. But anyway, that's that. That's how long. I have a very clear view on money and politics, which is a big theme in my book. And I argue, which I think comes down to what you say, that uh, we need a mechanism for public funding of political parties. Um, 
and indeed private funding thereof becomes should become very difficult unless through with a clear maximum gift. So the problem is not just the money in politics, though this is changing in America frighteningly in a way, but that very large donations will be discouraged. It, it, the interesting thing is that some of the parties, the Trump uh, machine works in this way, have become very, very, very good at getting small donations. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the internet has changed something. So I think money and its role in politics are a very big issue. The lobbying machines are a very big issue, but they're quite complicated. Now, the final thing is I just want to get to is because I was making a logical statement, not a political recommendation, that if you wanted to do this quickly on a big scale, it would have to involve an insurrection. Um, now, I'm in general not in favor of insurrections because my reading of the history of revolutions is they are generally a very, very long way round after the death of many millions of people to end up where you started. And the Russian Revolution is to me the definitive example of this. They've recreated the Tsarist system under Putin. It's more corrupt, more disgusting and more culturally ruinous than where they started. That's pretty horrendous for God knows how many millions of deaths. The, so the political mechanics of this are unbelievably important mm. and they have to be thought about much harder than I have. But I'll make one point on climate, which is a point on which we're going to disagree and this is basically a practical issue. I mean, I tend to think of it. Assume that climate is an existential issue, right? Assume that absolutely decisive action has to occur very, very soon and know that nothing, literally nothing we do in this country will make any difference at all. We produce 1% of emissions. Two thirds of the emissions in the world are produced by emerging and developing countries and all the growth. So this is a global problem. Um, now, that doesn't mean I have a solution of how you do this. At the moment, it seems uh, very, very difficult. But actually, I cannot imagine any conceivable process that will make a lot of difference in this very quickly that doesn't involve actually going through the machinery of government that we have in the world right now and an immense amount of pressure on it from the people at large and, a and I think a, uh, uh, an attempted transformation of the political process in our, a few relatively liberal and open democracies will unfortunately not change the outcome in any relevant way. So I basically ended up or with a conservative political position if you want to achieve any degree of change. You can rightly point out that probably won't work. I think that's quite likely, so I'm very pessimistic on it. But I don't see any alternative that will work better in the relative relevant timetable. And uh, that's really a very, very depressing situation to be in, but it's what how I think about it. Thank you very much. Sorry about the length of that. That's all right. Claire, um, do pick up any of the questions you want to. One particular one I'm interested in your view on is whether the idea of um, a citizens' assembly taking the place of the House of Lords could work, or whether if it was sort of co-opted, would it be co-opted by the establishment and the power holders and, and, and be, uh, be, uh, be a failure from the, from, from the start? So that's one, one model, replacing the House of Lords. That's very different from actually creating an independent a chamber. Um, I don't think the the workings of the House of Lord as a as a House of Citizens replacing House of Lord. I don't think we we have the the details yet. I'm not sure how actually it's going to change the system. For me, it's just um, um, you know a plaster on actually an existing problematic system. So I'm, I'm, I don't know. There are insiders, outsider strategies. Um, it's, you know, we need to, to explore. But for me, what's, what uh, I, we haven't talked about at the moment is how culture leads politics. And there are people in the audience that are working on actually how to engage, how to bring this into popular culture. I think we, we need to hear more about that. How do we do that effectively and quickly? Because 
to address the point of urgency, I think that's where we're going, we, we could see the biggest shift. So it's like almost like a social tipping point. If you bring this into popular culture and people realize the potential. And the other thing we haven't talked about are the scales. So at the moment, you know, you're, you're saying it needs to be addressed at the global level. Well, we've done the Global Citizens Assembly. That was an experiment for COP26. We're now working towards the, the UN Summit of the Future, looking at how a global assembly could fit within the multilateral system. But actually, how does that connect to the very local processes? So the multi-layered. And it, the, the momentum is already happening. I mean, Brian Eno gets requests and, and offers all the time for um, hearing people doing deliberative processes on the ground in, in communities. So it's just a question of actually ensuring people know that it's happening and that this collective agency, collective efficacy is, is built. And it's a movement building piece that we need to do, actually. And I think the, there's, we, the, it could happen faster than we think. Finally, Nicholas, um, there's been lots of talk about revolution, um, which I didn't expect in this, um, this <laughs> event. But in a way, your ambition for this goes way beyond the sort of single mechanism. You actually want to try and create a deliberative culture more generally across how we uh, make decisions. So I just wondered whether you wanted to end with almost what's the extension beyond what you've talked about? Well, yeah, I think of this, and I think I'm reasonably unique in this among people who are who have discovered or claim to have discovered that sortition is a, a kind of giant sanity mechanism, that I think of it as more a kind of hemisphere having opened up in one's mind about governance, that there are these two ways. We, uh, Martin spoke about the monarchical, our system, every, every polity in the modern world, every what we call democratic polity in the modern world, started as a uh, monarchy and remains a democratised monarchy. The president is a single figure, an elected monarch. Um, in, and, and here, it's exactly the same thing. We have a pyramid, we have a node of sovereignty, and uh, then, we, uh, th then we try to democratise that. Now, it is I, I sort of woke up at the start, maybe six months, maybe 12 months ago, to realise that Pericles, who most of you know of, wasn't the holder of any, uh, he was a general, one of 10, uh, he wasn't the holder of supreme office. There was no supreme office. The, the demos was supreme. Uh, and uh, and the, the bulle, the Council of 500, kept it all together and kept it functioning. This is even true of the Roman Republic, where there wasn't a, they had a period of monarchy and they built the Republic not to be a monarchy, to be uh, a system in which the people, the, the consul was, there were two of them and they could veto each other and so on. More generally, we could, uh, uh, and this is why I mentioned the mechanism in Venice, uh, we, can, we can mix and match these mechanisms and they can detox a lot of what has been, that spiky plant that keeps growing up the, the, the obelisk in my picture. Uh, that's what they did in Venice. Uh, these mechanisms of of using this idea of sampling and and um, getting the actual people to be their own experts to the extent that they can. That's what Joan Robinson was talking about. The seller is a professional, the buyer is an amateur, and we and that, that shouldn't just be thought about as uh, a consumer problem. That's the problem of our democracy. It's the problem of our relationship with Apple, with McDonald's, with all of these things, and we can we can change that. Uh, and these kinds of mechanisms are the sorts of things that can enable us to do that. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much to the audience here and online for a really good discussion. And nobody asked me about Susan Boyd. I'm we, very I was, disappointed. I was going to say, Susan Boyd, if you, want to, if you want to know about Susan Boyd, we're going to have some drinks afterwards, so do please ask um, Nicholas about the Susan Boyd um, uh, question. Just one final thing from me. Uh, you know, I come back to what I said at the beginning, which is when you think about the massive difficult challenges faced in this country and everywhere else, yes, there are some technocratic policy answers, but I don't think we will get them, get to them without political change and without 
um, institutions that drive better decision making, that drive moderation, that drive better reflection. And, and that political space needs to be created and it's not being created by today's institutions. Um, we are, um, both BIT and Nestor have done some work in this area, the collective cent Center for Collective Intelligence Design um, and BIT have, have done different experiments, um, both in the private sector and the public sector. It's an area I think of, of real interest. I know many of you here are involved in lots of practical experiments, so we'd love to keep the conversation going about what we're learning together and what the, the way forward looks like. So thank you very much for joining and um, do join us for some drinks. Thank you. As you know, Nicholas, the Athenians lost the Peloponnesian War yes. and the Roman Republic was devoured by a military dictatorship. Exactly, exactly. So it's hard, isn't it? Yes, yes. it's, it's hard. hard. That's right.